Welcome to Abergavenny Baptist Church. Life, faith, together. We'll now have our Bible reading. The Bible reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 7 to 10. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, uh, I'm sure those of you who have been aware of events in my life in the last few months uh, (laughs) won't be surprised to hear hear that I've had occasion to think about the verses which uh, (laughs) we just read. Uh, What does it mean to experience God's power in our weakness? How do we know the sufficiency of his grace? How is it when we're weak, then we're strong in God's strength? First of all, to look at this in its context, we have the issue of Paul's thorn. So what was Paul's thorn? Well, there have been various theories. Uh, One is that it was a long-standing physical ailment, uh, an illness of some sort. And some say it was to do with his eyesight, based on what he says at the end of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 11. See what large letters I am writing in my own hand, he says. So there's a view that says this was his thorn, that he had poor vision. Another theory is that it was a psychological conflict, because Paul was a Pharisee, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, an expert in the Judaic law. And yet God, in the sort of sense of irony that we often find from things that the Lord does, the Lord chose him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. This ultra-Orthodox Jew was the one to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And some say he was uh, conflicted by that. Then another theory is that he's talking about a person or perhaps a small group of people because he uses the terms a messenger of Satan in verse 7. Difficult people, people who were awkward, who impeded his ministry. You ever met any difficult people in the church? Never. Never. Perhaps more pertinent is, have you ever been a difficult person in the church? (laughs) And we're all aware, if we're realistic, that uh, this can happen. But the truth is, we don't really know. And the the best and most learned scholars agree there's no way of actually knowing what Paul's thorn was. But the important thing is, Paul understood it as something that was going to keep him humble, for stopping him becoming conceited by the amazing ways in which God used him and by the surpassing uh, revelations of God's love and mercy that he had. So despite those things, Paul says the thorn was keeping him humble. So what are we to learn from this? Well, it's crucial for us to understand that if we seek to sincerely follow the Lord, to walk in the way of Jesus, then there will be problems. The Lord himself told us, in this world, you will have trouble. And you don't have to be a Christian very long to realize that that's the case. Maybe physical illness, maybe psychological problems, maybe difficult people, maybe loss and grief maybe adverse circumstances, maybe spiritual attack through any and all of these means. So these are all things that happen to us as we seek to walk in the way of the Lord. 
It's great to have the young people here back from their camp, and we rejoice with them in terms of hearing how the Lord is moving powerfully in your time together. But just a word of warning to beware of what happens when you come back from camp, back to the realities of everyday life. It's in that kind of circumstance often that the Lord seems to allow us to experience difficulties and frustrations and struggles. Just after we've had a mountaintop experience of some kind, then we find there are things in the valley that we have to return to that can try to take away the value of what we've had together. But this is normal. It's part of normal Christian living. So don't be frightened by it. So then we need to look at what Paul does faced with this persistent thorn. And he says that he had prayed three times for the Lord to remove it from him. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. To be fairly sure, this wasn't what we might call casual prayer. This was clearly focused, intentional, almost perhaps we could use the word desperate prayer as he pleaded with the Lord to be released from whatever it was that was his thorn. And it's good for us to see that and to take note of that lesson when we find ourselves struggling for whatever reason, when we find ourselves attacked, find ourselves dealing with difficulties of difficult people, then it's good and necessary that we should pray like Paul did. The Lord wants to encourage us to pray in any and all circumstances. Not that they're necessarily the prayers will always be answered in the way we want, but we have the privilege of engaging with God in seeking and discerning his will for our lives in terms of how he does respond to us when we pray with that level of depth and intensity. It's been our privilege as a church, as many of you will know, to pray like this for sometimes people who are sick amongst us and to see that the Lord has graciously answered and they have recovered to a substantial extent. But that doesn't always happen and that does not in any way undervalue the need to pray. So we pray for release from difficulties, from oppression, from pain, from sickness. But we're willing to be ready to accept what it is that God wants us to learn if the prayers aren't answered in the way we would perhaps want. We need to acknowledge God's sovereignty in all things. So then we come to the extraordinary statements that Paul makes that are the key <clears throat> to these few verses. He says, The Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's just the kind of upside-down statement that we get used to hearing from Jesus, isn't it? It's somehow turning things on their head. How can strength... Sorry, how can weakness be strength? Well, if we think about it for a few moments, actually the whole gospel story is about God revealing his power by coming in weakness. Every Christmas we celebrate the incarnation and we can get so used to the stories around that, the angels and the shepherds and the wise men and all the rest of it, that we can lose the wonder of the very central theme that we're trying to celebrate and remember. That Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, engaged in an eternal dance of love with the Father and the Holy Spirit, left the glory of heaven and came to earth to be a king, to be a prince, to be a general in command of a mighty army. No, to be a baby. How amazing is that? To be 
a human baby. There's nothing weaker amongst all God's creatures than a human baby. So where is the power there? Well, of course, it's in the love that the baby calls forth from its mother and those around it. There is no stronger love in human terms than the love of a mother for her child and hopefully from a father for his child as well. There is the power, the power of love, revealed in weakness, revealed in dependency, revealed in the needing of nurturing and care. That is power, greater than the power of any army in the world. And then we think about Jesus' ministry, Who were the people he hung around with? Well, it was the smelly ones, as was mentioned earlier. The marginalized, the poor, not the rich and powerful, not those who seem to be running things in the land, but those who were on the edge, those who were rejected, those who were unknown, perhaps those who were oppressed. And then we come, of course, to think of the cross. What an extraordinary symbol. A naked man being crucified. Where is the power there? Well, of course, it's revealed a bit later. But on the cross, he takes upon himself all the pain, all the suffering, all the oppression, all the evil, all the sin of the world and dies to bear all that within his body, within his purpose, within his person. But then he raises from the dead, rises from the dead on the third day, showing that all that that he absorbed and took upon himself in weakness is defeated by the power that raises him from the dead. So that's how God's power works. It's always in the way we don't perceive to be the strength and power of the world. And we need to be careful about that as Christians, as church, as Christian organizations, because it's all too easy to see success in those areas, church, Christian organizations, and so on, in the same way as the world sees success. But that would be to make a wrong judgment. Because success for Christians, success for God, is all about us revealing and experiencing his power in weakness. Let me tell you a story to uh, illustrate this. For nearly 50 years, I've been involved in an organization called the Christian Medical Fellowship. It exists to encourage evangelism and discipleship amongst healthcare professionals, to be a public voice for Christian ethics in the marketplace uh, and parliament, and to encourage young healthcare professionals to serve the underprivileged in resource-poor situations overseas. I'm pleased to say the organization has matured enormously during the time I've been involved with it. But when I first got involved as a young medical student, I inquired of some of the senior members, what advice would you give to someone like me just starting out as a Christian in the profession? And they had a line a a policy that was trotted out whenever anybody asked that. And the line was this, get to the top, be on all the management committees, be involved in the Royal College for your specialty, and then you'll be able to really exert your influence in a Christian way. Well, I might sound plausible, but when I met some of these leaders at conferences, 
it was interesting to find that actually they weren't terribly mature as Christians. They had achieved eminence in their profession, but they were still babes in the faith. As Mike was reminding us last week, they hadn't been able to exert influence on the world that they were engaged in. Rather, the world had squeezed them into its mold because of all the time and energy that they had to invest in professionally advancing themselves. Now, that's not to say that it's wrong for Christians to be in positions of power. But it is to say we need to be extremely careful about how we measure success. Much later in my career, I met healthcare professionals who I would say uh, exemplified what being a Christian disciple in that specialty amounted to. These were Indian Christian doctors working in remote mission hospitals in far-flung areas of India. Nobody knew about them except their own supporters and family. But they were people who shone with the love and mercy and grace of Christ, serving the poor in the areas where they were. And I believe for Christians, that is the example of success. That is the example of God's power being made perfect in weakness. So let's be careful for things that look like they're successful in worldly terms. If they're Christian, then there shouldn't be the same standards of comparison. So many successful, in Christian terms, ministries are not noticed and unknown except by a few people. But these are the small incremental ways in which God's kingdom is being brought in. So what does all this mean for us? Well, if after persistent prayer, our illness, difficulty, adversity, our thorn does not improve or go away, then we need to accept that it is in God's purposes for us to remain in our current state and seek the new opportunities that that might give us. I think that's the key thing. It can feel as though we're defeated or that we're somehow less useful to God when we're sick, when we're injured, when we have things which take us out maybe of the areas of ministry that we're used to having. But none of that is true. And if we feel that's the case with us, then I suggest what we need to do is ask the Lord to show us what different things, what new things perhaps, is it that you would have me do that I can do in my current state? There's a brilliant line in one of Graham Kendrick's old songs. I call them old now if they're 30 years old probably. He turns our weaknesses into his opportunities. Our weaknesses into opportunities. That's a really helpful thing to hang on to. And in that way, God may show us new things that we can do, new ways in which we're able to serve him. Perhaps we need to develop new patterns of prayer. When we're laid aside, as it were, and unable to be active, then there's plenty of time for praying. Not just intercessory prayer, all that's, that's good, of course, but contemplative prayer, meditative prayer, other types of prayer so we can draw close to God and be aware of his will being revealed in new ways. Now again, a story just to uh, illustrate this. Um, many of you know I was involved for many years with a Christian medical uh, education organization called Prime Partnerships in International Medical Education. The story of how this began is interesting because it's all about something emerging from apparent weakness. The key founder, who's now gone to be with the Lord a few years ago, a man called John, uh, was a GP in the south of England. He'd been a missionary in 
um, uh, sorry, I can't remember where now, anyway, a remote and difficult country. Um, and then done many years in the NHS, and he believed that as he was approaching 60, it was God's will for him to return, Bhutan, that's the place, Bhutan, to Bhutan as a missionary with a lot more experience than he'd had the first time he'd been there. But uh, less than a year before this was due to happen, he developed colon cancer and had to have treatment and you know, a whole lot of changes were made in his life and he wasn't able to pursue the course that he believed God was preparing for him in terms of returning to Bhutan. But what did happen is he looked for what he could do in the current circumstances that he faced. And he developed the pattern of small teams going to teach and encourage and inspire healthcare professionals in resource poor settings. And over several years, what grew from an idea involving perhaps half a dozen people became a movement involving hundreds of people in very many countries all over the world. So that was an example of God taking weaknesses, weakness, illness, offered to him and multiplying it in ways that nobody around the founder could have anticipated when it first started. He turns our weaknesses into his opportunities. So I'd just like to conclude by reading a poem. Uh, this will be known, I expect, by most of the older ones, maybe not so much by the younger ones. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colours he worketh steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why the dark threads are as needful in the skillful weaver's hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I see the seams, the tangles, but he sees perfectly. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives his very best to those who choose to walk with him. Amen. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit our website, abgavenibaptist.co.uk.